All right. Um, so happy to see everyone. Again, our attendance rates are remaining high. Um, and I'm particularly impressed because I know that assignment two was due like a few minutes ago. Um, don't worry if you submit it right now. You know, we have a, a few minute grace period. Um, so if you are anxious to submit or whatever, just submit now. Um, unless you, you know, you have a preordained uh, extension. Um, but please do submit your assignment. Um, as I know, your TAs and myself are really excited to see how you've mastered your subfields of the discipline. Um, maybe some of you talked about families, so you know, maybe, maybe you could be teaching this. Um, so my, my lapel, if it falls off, someone, the, the thief is back. Um, someone, I don't know who does this, someone stole all the little clips off of our microphones. Um, and they stole the nice clicker. This is like the bane of my existence. And in the Tuesday lecture, so the Monday lecture, part of why it's so great is we had a really nice clicker. Um, and now we have this really, really cruddy thing. So um, it may be hard for me to go back and forth between the slides. Um, anyway, so we've now lost our microphone box, our regular microphone, and the clips from our two microphones, and our clicker. So. I don't know who's coming in here and trying to mess up our class. But anyway, hopefully I don't strangle myself with this. Um, OK, so welcome to week number 12 of our full year adventure into sociology. Um, again, you've now, you're, you're going into unchartered territory and domain uh, because you know half your classes have like a max of like 11, year, of 11 real lectures, um, but you have 10 more to look forward to. Um, so really exciting. You're going to make it to 20 plus lectures, um, and that's something you can, you can brag to you know, maybe a small amount of people to, um, but still something. Um, so just logistical stuff. Um, I, uh, I submitted, as I said, I submitted my request. Uh, last week, the beginning of last week, uh, regarding our test two. Um, so if you check the syllabus, you'll see, um, fingers crossed, we get it the same way we did last term. Um, so ideally, Monday, February 4th. Um, but it could be either that week or the week after or the week before. Um, I hope it's that week and I hope it's that day. Um, but I have no control over that. Um, I, as, just as last term, I'll keep you updated um, regardless of outcome, um, but keep your fingers crossed for me as well. Um, I hope, so just show of hands, did anyone go to the, uh, put up your hand, sorry, if you went to the library drop-in session last Friday, anyone? Okay, so at least one person. I know 20 plus people signed up, so hopefully, uh, Maybe they're all from the Tuesday class, um, or they're the kind of person that watches the online lectures and is too cool for the classroom. Um, but anyway, I wanted, uh, you know, uh, I'll solicit feedback on how that was. Um, that was kind of a last minute thing, uh, but, but hopefully it was useful. I know our lead TA, Jason, was there as well. Um, so that's the logistics for now. Again, assignment two is due right now. Please submit it. Um, today, we'll be going over families. Um, and I, you know, I, I, again, I sincerely apologize for last week. I said I was turning over a new leaf. There's going to be less of me talking and more engagement. Um, and then I kind of screwed that up and I yabbed for an hour and a half. So this week, though, it's going to be quite different. Um, it's going to be more like that narcissistic lottery game, but serious. So you, in my mind, I'm trying to blend those two things. So it could be an epic fail. But um, there, are, there are memes, which I didn't upload, um, but, but I have here, and in, they're interactive memes. So um, anyway, and then lots of group work, and I will be reinforcing, uh, you know, how, what better week than on the family week, where we talk about, you know, created families and problematic definitions of the family, what better week to solidify your lifelong relationship with your study buddy, you know, emergent family form, what better week to do that than this week? Right? So if that works, then that'll be um, a continuing theme. Interactive memes designed to get you to annoy and ingratiate yourself with your study buddy. So fun times ahead. Ah. OK, so remember, please submit assignment two on Quercus um, if you haven't. All right, so the family. 
Um, again, this week will be much more interactive uh, than other weeks. There aren't a whole ton of definitions. Um, there's mainly these ones here. Um, you do not need to, I will not be grilling you on this. These are historical definitions of the family, and I put them here. There are kind of anchors, or definitional and conceptual anchors of the week. Uh, remember, in this class, we set up definitions, we set up claims, and then we kind of tear them down, confuse ourselves, confuse one another, and then regroup and say, whoa, like there's a lot going on in the world. And now here's what I know. I went through this mess, I climbed this hill, and now I've leveled up, and I can explain and articulate thoughts I never knew I even had. Okay, so the family. We all have ideas of what the family are, or what the family is, what families are, and so on. Um, but today we're going to start again with formal definitions just to see how have people analyzed this kind of unit. Have they, have they analyzed it around bloodlines, around social ties, around economic ties? Um, and then what sorts of issues does that raise for wider society, for specific individuals, and so on? Um, again, we are in a time of major social change. Um, Keep in the back of your mind shows like Modern Family um, and, and so on when, when we're going through these definitions. Okay, so definition one. Quote, a social group characterized by common residence, so living together, economic cooperation. Um, so, you know, maybe the parents work or the father or the mother is the primary breadwinner and then the children are paid for until they start working part-time jobs and maybe get their money stolen from their allowance money. Uh, I'm sure that's happened to a lot of people here. Um, so living together, economic cooperation, they have a, a kind of understanding of, of where the money's coming from and who's spending it, and reproduction. Um, so in most cases, as we'll see, in what's called the nuclear family, um, the little ones are the genetic or adopted offspring of the bigger ones ones being humans. So the parents give birth, or legal birth, adoption. Um, they, they birth the, the children, and then they have all these relationships. So I'm speaking in a rather stilted way to think of that kind of sociologist that C. Wright Mills was critical of. Um, and you know, we're studying this formally. Um, so they live together. They have an uh, economic understanding. And it's based around reproduction. Um, it includes adults of both sexes, at least two of whom maintain a socially approved sexual relationship. Um, that's a really bizarre way of saying, um, again, the parents are presumably having a sexual relationship. Um, it's, it shouldn't be something incestuous like mother and son or whatever. Um, so, uh, but that definition leaves, leaves that open, strangely. Um, and one or more children own or adopted of the sexually cohabiting adult. So again, that's probably the kind of Stereotypical, um, stereotype not being used necessarily in a bad way, like stereotype we talked about last, last week, um, but that's more the kind of, you know, mom and dad and two, two plus children uh, idea. Um, and that's from 1949, and Murdoch is a very famous anthropologist who studied kinship or kind of family studies around the globe historically. Um, so that's kind of one that fits uh, several different cultures and time periods. Um, now, slightly later, 1963, so that's kind of the basic definition of the family we probably all know and love or hate. Um, now, definition number two, a social arrangement based on marriage and the marriage contract, including recognition of the rights and duties of parenthood, common residence for husband, wife, and children, and reciprocal, meaning two-way, economic obligations between husband and wife. So reciprocal economic obligations between husband and wife, based on when that was written, and, and women tended to be kind of stay-at-home moms in that time, um, that, that meant the husband goes and earns the bread and then the woman stays at home and slices it up and makes little PB&J sandwiches with the crust off for Billy. Um, OK, so these are our two big definitions of the family that we work with. Um, what we will be addressing, I'm not going to grill you yet. You're going to be grilling each other as, as study partners. Um, but think, again, we're living in 2019 now. I haven't talked about that, but it's a new year, new time. Um, think who's included and who's excluded in these definitions. Um, so what assumptions are being made? 
As sociologists, when we look at definitions, terms, policies, as we'll see, we always want to see what assumptions, what taken for granted stuff is being presented to us. Um, so think of the weeks we've covered so far. Which ones apply here? Is this talking about a specific culture? Is this all around the world? Is there a Western assumption, a colonial assumption? Are they making assumptions about gender? Um, again, I kind of filled some of those in. Um, and then sexuality, I think pretty clearly some assumptions there are going on. Um, now, in part, you'll see those are dated definitions, so it's not like we're taking definitions from this year. Uh, so th things have changed over time. Families have become more progressive, as we'll see, in the way they're defined. But these definitions, I think, do capture the kind of reality that most people encounter when they're kids in terms of thinking of families and what that means. So again, the, de the purpose of this week is to take those working definitions and then talk amongst ourselves to try to figure out, um, A, what sort of implications do these definitions have for all of us, as we're all part of families uh, to some extent, um, and B, how might we change these definitions to better reflect kind of social changes that are going on around us. Um, okay, so just as there are kind of these two main definitions of the family um, that, that kind of work together, again, one more focused on marriage and the other more focused on kind of mutual obligations, although they both touch on that. Um, remember, with the, uh, it, it's very important to put definitions in terms of the context in which they emerged. Um, I'm always talking about how the social thinkers we address in this class really are their work and their questions um, and their crises and personal turmoils and all of that, they're very grounded in that historical moment when industry boomed um, in, in Britain and uh, North America, uh, the context that we're mostly focusing on, um, but France as well and Germany, um, the Industrial Revolution. And remember in the gender week and the, and the theory weeks, we talked about how in the Industrial Revolution, there was this thing called the separation of spheres as urban cities were growing, as factories were being created, and men were responsible for working in them, and men and women and children kind of got uprooted from their farms where they were living. Most people were self-subsistent, um, but now they all were laboring for other people and, and working in much more kind of centralized cities as opposed to really sprawled out, scattered farmlands where it was like, I have my farm here and my big family with 10 children and we make our own food, we do all our own stuff, um, to now being much more similar to how we are today. Um, where, you know, I'm Lawrence and I teach courses at U of T and I get my food from, you know, fresh and wild at King and Spadina, and then I get my clothes at, you know, whatever, online, Amazon, H&M, vintage, whatever. Everyone else is doing stuff for me, and, my, and I'm paying, I'm exchanging money for that. So a very different world than, than kind of before these things were made. Um, so the family was key in this transition. Um, so the family, historically in the Western context, again, um, has always been kind of centered about the around the role of parents and children, but it was much more extended and bigger than it became. So the term the nuclear family really was born around this historical moment where people kind of started to leave their like family legacy homes. Um, so you could think of either farmers or you could think of like nobles and royalty, people that like, keep living on the same land kind of permanently. This time when people were forcibly uh, exodusing, leaving uh, these rural areas and moving into cities, the family then shifted from this big kind of evolving historical unit and onto a new unit based around the sexual and romantic and emotional union of two presumably consenting heterosexual adults, one man, one woman, who then decide to have children and create their own family. Um, so again, we're all born into families, uh, but we create our own families uh, when we decide to have a partner, be a lone parent, um, move out of the house, and all that. Um, so, as modern as we are today, with, with our new definitions of family, again, being more 
all-encompassing, being more, you know, embracing multiculturalism, um, embracing the LGBTQ community. This idea of families as being kind of broken off of this bigger, larger legacy. Um, again, so all of you, everyone in this room, as having the ability to kind of create your own family, um, this, this is not an entirely new concept. Um, it's just been limited to heterosexual men and women and children. Um, so the extended family, again, as we'll discuss um, in the North American context, if you're just thinking of kind of like, you know, again, stereotypes of um, British people that came into the country, um, and, and not every ethnic group, um, you'll, you'll, you, you may think of extended families as being more linked to certain cultures than others. Um, again, in, in North America, in the uh, United States of America in particular, um, the extended family has gone down over time. People do tend to move away from their parents, um, and that's kind of a cultural norm in Canada and Toronto, in, in our urban centers um, in particular as well. Um, some, you know, th there's an interesting trend now <laughs> where people my age, uh, so people in their early 30s are returning home because they can't find jobs and stuff, um, but they usually aren't happy to be doing that. Um, most people, the, the, again, the norm we've learned growing up is, you know, maybe stay at home till you're done school, uh, but kind of once you're able to self-subsist, you want to go and form your own family. Um, so leave the legacy, acknowledge it respectfully, um, but go and make your own. Okay, so that's kind of the backdrop. So again, we have this idea of the family, this definition really around sexual union, children, kind of economic, social relationships. Um, we talked about the family as well early in the term. Um, so I'll address this question of logistics later in terms of test two, um, but I, I hope you start, I hope you see kind of um, as you're reading these texts, but yeah, even if, even if only when I'm lecturing, um, that many of the terms you're learning now were, were already covered and, and, and the concepts. Maybe some different words are being used, um, but this week very much grows out of uh, the gender and the uh, socialization weeks. Um, so Eichler critiques these definitions of the family uh, and kind of the stereotypical statistical idea of the family in the West more broadly um, by saying, you know, this idea of the family being based on heterosexual union and the production of, of children, um, this kind of sets every other potential family group, so another set of individuals that may feel that they are united um, in some, you know, intangible but very strong way, um, that they're not just friends, they're not just... Um, you know, we now use the word partner very differently than we used to, uh, to, to, so that people don't have to out themselves by saying boyfriend and girlfriend and all of that, and to put it in the same level. Um, but this, this idea of a, of a kind of core heterosexual family around procreation uh, inherently deviantizes uh, or makes marginal or other all these, all these, well, other family forms that may exist. Um, and this, according to Eichler, has negative impacts on people. Um, so really building on that socialization week, um, the fact that someone may think, you know, I'll never be able to start um, my own ideal family because I'm gay or I don't want children um, or for whatever, or I'm polyamorous or for some other reason, um, this impacts all of these sorts of socialization aspects tied with the family for those people. Um, so obviously, number one, socialization. Um, in any given family, you are taught things by your parents, um, but also for a person that thinks they can't start uh, a presumably normal family, that impacts the kind of person they may become. Um, it could become almost a self-fulfilling prophecy where a person says to themselves, you know, society, I, I kind of get the idea in society that I'm supposed to move away from my parents, start things on my own, um, pull myself up and, and be independent, but um, there's, there's no narrative or norm uh, for me to fit into. Uh, how am I supposed to start a family? Let's say this was 1950 or 1960, um, again, as, as a gay man that doesn't want children but kind of wanted a husband, um, 
I, I wouldn't even think that this was a, uh, a reality I could do. So my whole notion of the family would kind of be, um, you know, hurt a bit. Uh, now it's quite different where uh, I'm allowed to say I'm in a kind of childless, uh, same-sex, common-law partnership. Um, but that's very new. Um, the family, as we know, is responsible for e relationships and helping people form them, their sense of self, their sense of obligations with others. Um, so if a family is not, you know, if, if, if people raised into a family, um, again, are taught that they're actually not really a family, um, or people, you know, constantly question their familial status. Um, so, for example, someone raised um, by same-sex parents generations ago when it was, you know, through, let's say, a common-law same-sex couple, that could be very different, uh, difficult for a child to articulate to other people um, and find commonality with. Um, and then, of course, residence, economics, sexuality, and reproduction, all of these things the family is the seat of. Um, so I won't go in depth on all of them because I want to, again, shift things over to you. Um, but defining the family and, in a way, almost keeping it updated with the way society is changing, um, Canadian society, Toronto society in our case, is very important because, you know, really, sociologically um, and anthropologically, um, I'll get to that in a second, what I mean by that. But, but as social scientists more broadly, the family really is kind of society writ small. Um, it's almost like a microcosm of the wider society. And that was one of the points I tried to get across in the socialization week. Again, it's where children first learn societal norms, they learn uh, what sort of ideals they should have, what things are taboo, um, and really, you know, what kind of person they can be in society. Uh, their kind of occupation, their kind of personality, all of this. So if our definitions um, are restricting people, then this can have major impacts, um, even if society is, as a whole is kind of tending uh, to be much more progressive in their ideas. If, if our notion of the family is still kind of from a, a previous time, that creates big contradiction for people. Okay, so now we go. So any questions so far? You'll see my interactive um, meme. So, okay, so you'll see on your, this is to give you extra motivation to come to class. Um, so you'll see on the one I uploaded, it's just called question. Um, but little do the people that don't come, on, come to class or watch the lectures online, little do they know we're actually going to be having um, study buddy activities. Um, okay, so these questions, again, they're not normal questions, like normal in terms of social AO3. We are now going to have more project-based questions. Um, and again, I will ask you um, at the end of the class kind of what you think of this um, and how we should proceed. Um, because I want these lectures really to be all about helping you all um, and not just me being, again, self-centered up here. Um, okay, so now with identify your study buddy, um, whether they're your historical study buddy from term one or a new one. Um, you can also work in threes or fours if you'd like. Um, I know study buddy relationships grow as the year grows, so, you know, maybe you will become a study class and then everyone will be best friends. That would be fantastic. Um, so, but with one, at least one other person, and you have to, um, imagine that you and your study buddy have been hired to draft a large company's policy on medical coverage. How would you define family? What should be included in this definition? Why is defining a family important? Get together with your study buddy and brainstorm about this for five minutes. Now, you may be saying, what the heck does any of this have to do with medical policy? So, remember, when we talked about inequality, uh, jobs, workplaces, all of this, the way that we define the family, you know, again, I, I, for any of you that have been employed, think of, you know, the kind of benefits you get, um, the taxes you pay, how we define the family impacts, again, um, you know, who you could get coverage for. Um, so think of this. Again, the questions will, will vary as they go. 
Um, but we'll hand out some, take out a scrap piece of paper if you don't have any, um, and Sarah will be around handing some out as well. You don't have to hand this in to me, um, but I do think writing it is probably better than just trying to remember it. Um, so you can leave today with little notes, study buddy notes on applying. Um, so, and I'm trying to make all of these questions very application-based, just to give you more examples to remember things. Strum of learning and development going on. Okay, so I now I am querying, uh, questioning the study buddy groups. Um, let me know what you came up with. Um, so first, anybody, how would you define the family? Oh, yep. Oh, here. So the benefit of no clip. Ta-da. Oh. <laughs> so, like, that could be your pets or your partner or your partners. So, it's inclusive. Okay. So, an inclusive relationship surrounded by love. Now, the only thing I would challenge you on that is you know, sometimes people get together, they form a family, they form a union, sexual, emotional, whatever. But then, as the years go by, love wanes. So, then those kind of families, what would they do? Is it, and, and if, in terms of, like, I get the idea, but then imagine in terms of measuring that, you have to do, like, an annual survey, and you do a love meter and then it's like, oh, crap, 10 years in, I'm now, like, my love is negative or something in a, in a year, um, that I'm not a family. But, I feel like if the love was 0%, then they probably wouldn't be the same household anymore. Yeah. So it's interesting. So, so again, uh, if love wanes, they would likely divorce or separate. Um, so, anyway, I'm just, I'm just being... Funny. So I think, I think union based on love, again, is something as we'll see as the lecture progresses. Um, I do think the new definitions move more towards that. Some kind of, some kind of choice and more based on relationship. Yep. Is there anyone else? Oh, the other side. Do, 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 do. Here you are. For, in regards to how I define family, I would say it's someone who you trust or are close enough with that you would have them be your overseer in any kind of medical situation or mm -hmm. just, you know, close enough that you trust them. Right. It's not, even people you love, some people that you wouldn't want to be in that situation. Because not everyone is that close with their like, blood relatives or their mm -hmm. spouses or you know, the people that they're close with. I would trust my sister to oversee me, but I would also trust my best friend to be right. an overseer. I consider them to be family. As well. mm -hmm. Great. So building on the idea of love, and remember, particular to this example of medical coverage. So think, you know, if you um, become accidentally disabled or something on the workplace, and someone has to make sure, you know, you get the checks that are allotted to you, um, or you develop an illness and you're unable to take care of yourself, you want to make sure that the person that's actually uh, that you actually trust is able to kind of dole that stuff out for you. Um, so again, if family was only defined around kind of heterosexual union and you did have a partner or even, as that student said, a best friend somewhere that you trust your life with, um, but you couldn't uh, have them as your beneficiary or guarantor or whatever word they use in the specific case, um, you may then be in not so great a spot should you find yourself in trouble at some point. Um, okay, so that obviously addresses the second question of, uh, and third question of uh, why, of who should be included. Um, again, I think the, if any of you came up with anything very different, please tell me. Um, but I, I think the consensus would be around having someone that you trust uh, and are confident would have your best interests in mind. Um, and then linking to why defining a family is important is again, as we saw in that little slide previously, um, the members of your family, again, whether they fit the traditional definition or not, um, you're, especially in university in first year, I mean, you'll develop all sorts of relationships with people that will become basically family members. Um, just show of hands how many people are living on campus. 
Okay, so you're probably, hopefully, or, or you will if you haven't, um, developing tight relationships with people on campus. Um, again, I do lurk looking around the room and I see all little clusters forming uh, of people. So, um, you know, in my idea of the lifelong study buddy, hopefully you are developing lifelong relationships here. Um, and again, this class, think, hmm, is this a family? Is it a family now? Will it be in the future? Um, again, I know for me, so some of the people I consider closest, uh, myself closest to, um, are, are friends from childhood and friends I made in undergrad. Um, and I would consider them family, maybe not by a textbook definition, um, but they do have that role. Um, okay, so we'll cover a little bit more and then we'll have a break. All right, so you'll see we're talking about family. When, when you're talking about family, you always kind of have to talk about things like love and, and marriage and relations. Um, you'll see, though, kind of echoing the times, the definitions that we're centering on aren't actually super, super focused on marriage. Um, so for just to make sure we're all on the same page before moving on, um, can anyone define, uh, or, and it doesn't have to be in a, you know, really specific way, um, but can anyone tell me what um, a common law relationship is? Yep. Okay, and then what does, what does being a common law partner mean? Like, what does it entitle you to? Yes, perfect example, um, so, or perfect explanation. So a common law couple, so part of why we'll see not only is marriage on the decline, so heterosexual and gay, I mean now gay marriage is very recent, um, but heterosexual, so we'll just focus on heterosexual marriage because that's kind of what it's always been in Canada until recently. Um, but so not only is heterosexual marriage on the decline, um, but there has been a massive increase in what's, com what's called common law partnerships over time. Um, so some people think, you know, you may think, you may draw the automatic conclusion and say, oh, well, there's more, um, there's more cohabiting couples and common law couples because it's all gay individuals doing this. Um, but, th but that's not true. Even within heterosexual adults, um, marriage rates are sharply going down, divorce rates are going up, and again, common law status is going up. Um, and moving on to the work and inequality weeks we've covered, sociologically that kind of makes sense. Um, people are moving out of home later, the, uh, the job market is becoming scarier for a lot of people. I, I don't want you to leave here feeling, <laughs> feeling anxious about things, but, but people have, you know, it, it's, it's harder for people to say, you know, at age 25 I'm going to get married, buy a house, have kids, all of that. Um, you know, all those things are getting more expensive um, and norms are changing. Um, so that's why when we talk about the family, marriage is not as central um, as, as it may have been 50 years ago or longer. All right. So I know our little study buddy session got you all riled up, but I'm hearing a lot of whispering and canoodling around the class, so please try to be quiet while we talk about the decline of marriage. Okay. Um, so as I said, marriage is still an important topic, though. So I'm not by any means using my own personal biases on marriage. I myself, I'm never going to get married. Um, it was actually a, well, I'm saying this on camera. I always forget that's there. So, um, but, um, you know, it's good that I forget it's there. It means, you know, it's, we're, we're uh, you know, not being, feeling surveilled. Um, but me and my partner decided a few years ago we're never gonna get married. And for us, kind of getting a home was our version of marriage. And, you know, I was younger then, and I, I, was, I said, you know, but gay people just got the right for this. What the hell? Like, when we'll be, like, pioneers. And, and then he's like, no, I don't want that. This not, I, I just don't want that. It's, what, what's the point? Um, and increasingly, when I talk to people, my straight friends as well, you know, not that much in a bubble, um, I'm finding that sentiment increasingly of just, you know, why do you need to prove your relationship by marriage? And then what if you do break up? And then it's this big hassle. Um, so, so that's a kind of new norm that's going around. Um, it is, you know, the divorce rate is extremely high in the gay community as well, um, in, in many places. So I think maybe when it became first, I, I know I had that feeling anyway, when it was newly introduced, I was like, oh, I'm going to get married. I'm going to screw you to all those people that, that you know, whatever, uh, made me feel weird. Um, 
but then ultimately I decided not to. Um, but me and my partner are a family. Um, so anyway, long, that's my long-winded TMI way of saying um, the, the uh, same-sex marriage and marriage in general is still a sacred, very important thing for a lot of people. Um, but it is on the decline. Um, so, for example, in 2011, um, only 67% of Canadian families were married, um, but in, in 1981 it was 83%. Um, so that is a 25% roughly drop, um, and the number is still going down. So that's due to a lot of factors. Again, people uh, starting relationships later. Um, you know, I'm sure there's studies on, on uh, the availability of Tinder and Grindr and stuff. You're sitting at home with your partner, um, and then, you know, you should uninstall all those apps once you're, once you're exclusive with someone. Um, but with all these apps, it's kind of, you know, why don't I just walk out of the room and swipe right on 100 people and then see what happens, you know? But anyway, so... Um, <laughs> Marriage is on the decline, but it's still something people fought for the right to have. People are still, the, even though the marriage, and this is the important point, uh, I jest when I say that stuff about tindering and grindering, um, even though marriage is going down, the overall rate of people that still are in kind of one-on-one -on -one, um, monogamous relationships, that hasn't changed very much. So people still are having meaningful in their terms, familial relationships without kind of that government official document. Um, and as the student said in the middle, um, common, law relation, common law status, um, roughly around the time of gay marriage legalization, it's kind of still in the works, um, but common law status is increasingly being elevated to the same level as marital status. So that impacts people's choices too, right? So again, for me and my partner, after we hit the three, the three year mark of living together, um, we now, uh, you know, uh, we, we do our taxes together um, and our kind of benefits arrangements work together and all of that. Um, again, I'm probably going to be, uh, once, once this course goes live on the internet, probably have the, the CRA coming after me saying, you didn't start filing to whatever. So, but, but anyway, hopefully not. Um, okay, so for the first time ever, we're actually, um, I think, uh, ahead of schedule. Um, so we're going to take a 10-minute break. Um, and I know you guys, it's so sad because you haven't gone over any of these, you know, theoretical perspective shifts since November because we didn't have it last week. Um, so during your break, um, you know, you, you, have a, you have that to look forward to. Uh, looking at the family through the lenses of multiple theories. Um, okay, and again, I tried to make today more fun and a little bit light because I know that you all must be zonked from writing your uh, literature reviews. Um, okay, so when we reconvene, we will go over um, the material, have a couple more sessions, and I will talk a little bit about the test, um, and then having that um, test viewing arrangement, uh, which I will likely spread over a couple of days later in the month. All right, so I'll see you all in 10 minutes. Um, okay, so we now have discussed the family, uh, and we've exercised our critical thinking skills and, and activity partner skills and all that, and policy making skills. Um, and so now we're going to keep doing that, um, but before we do, we're going to try to extend our discussion of the family into the same sorts of theories we've been using all term. Um, again, as sociologists, we are by definition masters of the social realm. Um, so we have to understand every institution. Shh. Thank you. <laughs> Trying something new, just shushing people and then instead of asking. Um, just is getting particularly loud in the back. Um, okay. And you know, we have two more activities. So if you want to be loud then, think of those as like ch chatter pockets. Um, okay, so functionalism. So we're now trying to understand again, how is it, so I drew the connection between the family and the Industrial Revolution. Um, functionalism 
again, kind of going through the order uh, in the sociological theoretical history and imagination. Remember, the textbook kind of presents it as uh, ideas about organic unions um, and, and people being integrated and needing to be integrated and institutions being integrated. Um, that started with what was called functionalism. Um, so early, early, early on in kind of sociology's prehistory, people like August Comte and Herbert Spencer, um, who were philosophers by training, they really wanted to understand how and why society operates the way that it does, uh, or various societies operate the way that they do. Um, and why, you know, why it is so hard for institutions to change over time, um, and, and overall why social change tends to be relatively rare. Um, so a functionalist approach to the family, it's, it's probably the most intuitive approach for this. Um, it's essentially the idea um, that families help, like more than anything else in society, um, they help keep people connected to one another. Uh, I mean, nothing does this more clearly than a family. You have a role um, as a son, a daughter, a child, as a guardian, as a parent, as a mother, a father. Um, and these keep you in harmony with other people. Um, so, you know, all these expressions we have, like, blood is thicker than water, um, and all these other, you know, books you see, movies about relationships and the importance of staying close with your family and your grandparents and all of this. Um, in, in Canadian society, anyway, the family often is seen as the kind of glue that keeps an otherwise fragmented society together. Um, so that's why things, even like, um, you know, I don't know how many of you are aware, I guess you'd be coming just out of this, um, but, you know, the, the recent changes to the Ontario sex ed high school or, or sex ed curriculum, um, one of the major uh, points of contention politically, or it became a political issue, but one of the major points of, connect, uh, of contention or conflict uh, between voters and parents and all sorts of other interested people um, was the extent to which educating children and adolescents about kind of sexual relations in a more detailed manner and relationships and all of that, um, whether that would kind of shake up our ideas of sexual union in the family. Um, so people argue and debate over kind of what should be taught to kids uh, because some people think, you know, teaching those things will help you make healthy choices uh, in your own best interest, but other people are fearful that, oh, if you teach children these things, they may become promiscuous or against the family or something. Um, so people are, you know, divided in terms of uh, what they think the role of the family is. Um, but, but needless to say, I think most people would see the family as important um, to, to social order. And that view comes from this functionalist perspective of seeing, you know, maybe someone's having a really hard time with their friends at work, at school, um, and, you know, you come home to your family. Um, so it's a major social institution. Um, now, as I said already, I already talked about the connection to the Industrial Revolution um, and the division of labor that occurred. Uh, so again, men were largely working outside of the house, and this notion of the family as having a protective socialization function, um, so you know, someone you can literally come home to cry to, to get advice from, think of a child being bullied. Um, this ties into what functionalists call the two dual roles of the family. So on the one hand, there's an instrumental side. Um, so it's easiest to think of this with parents and children. Um, so instrumentally, um, what do you, and again, you don't even need to know anything from this course to answer this, this question I'm just gonna ask you. But instrumentally, um, what functions do you think a family plays for children? Instrumentally, so practically. In terms of like, Basic, basic things, basic necessities, yep. Food, yes, food and shelter. Um, so think, think of the first things you think would be requisite or required for a family with children to have. They need to have a stable place of living, presumably. They may move around a lot, but you know, maybe someone who works for the army or for um, a global company or something. But presumably the child will always have shelter and they'll always have food and then they'll always have supervision. Um, and then they'll have some way of getting an education, right? 
So those are the instrumental things. Um, you may have parents that never talk to you um, and are you know, awful to you subjectively. And you know, increasingly, that's become more important, uh, you know, people recognizing that publicly. But instrumentally, um, what, what it, uh, it's, it's more an economic thing that parents pay for their children and provide them with resources. Um, now, of course, without that, those are, that's the instrumental function, um, and, and over time has mostly been associated with um, one of two parents, as we'll see. Now, the expressive role is all that other stuff we covered in the socialization week. Um, so the emotions, the relationship building, the sense of self a person has. Um, so linking this to the Industrial Revolution, and remember the separation of spheres, so remember, uh, instrumental is things related to money and then property. Um, so again, a child having somewhere to live and food in their belly and all of that, um, and dental things and whatever. Um, expressive is all the emotional aspects of life. Someone whose shoulder to cry on, someone to console you, someone to teach you and endow you with their wisdom. So true and false. Men are the most likely to fulfill the expressive role within the family unit. Show of hands, who thinks that's true? Show of hands, who thinks that's false? Okay, yes. So historically, um, this would be false. Um, why? Again, I want to make sure all of you know these things. Why is this false? Yep. Because stereotypically speaking, women are responsible for like expressive roles, like providing care and you know nurturing the kids. And men are responsible for instrumental role, being like the breadwinner and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So again, sometimes, you know, don't overthink things too much. This is um, exactly, you know, go back to the Industrial Revolution, people leaving self-subsisting households, men were going to the factory, mom was staying at home. Um, and then, you know, kids would, would learn, you know, talk to mom with your issues, dad's busy, he's tired from work, all those things you think, you know, think of the show Married with Children um, and, and uh, Al Bundy just plopping in front of the TV. Um, and, and, you know, th the Simpsons, all in the family, all, all these images you see uh, kind of in Western recent, last 50, 60 years uh, of TV shows and portrayals of the family um, where, you know, the, the man is kind of outside all day providing those instrumental functions and then the mother does everything else. Um, and again, so in functionalism, they're not necessarily justifying that. Um, that's often a criticism that's given to them. But they were more trying to understand, again, a hundred, couple hundred years ago mostly, why is it that families have kind of emerged the way they have? The, again, usually this heterosexual union um, and having these sorts of instrumental and expressive roles. So I think that school provided a very good conceptual um, baseline and, and was important for looking at those first couple definitions. Um, although now, as you see, things have changed a bit or changed considerably. Um, so functionalism, uh, as we've seen throughout the course, kind of whenever it's brought up, it always, whenever something, usually when, when there's a new issue, a new event, um, particularly a hundred years ago, maybe now people wouldn't intuitively turn to it. Um, but when sociology was very young, um, usually when a new kind of issue was being discovered, people would first think of it through the lens of functionalism, which makes sense. You know, I'm looking at something new. I want to know how it functions, how it fits into society. Um, but then the next natural thought, uh, thought sequence is to bring in questions of inequality and power. So it's all, you know, it's well and good to say the family serves expressive and, and, and instrumental roles. Um, but if you take that one step further, you may start to think, oh, it's kind of interesting that we've gender segregated the family. Um, so how does it really impact uh, men and women, the fact that they're performing such different roles? You know, if we think that our lives are socially constructed, our personalities and stuff, you know, um, basically how you spend your time impacts how you feel about yourself, how people see you, then it's very important um, that this is gender segregated because men and women may be, um, you know, developing differently if, if, if they keep doing this. 
Um, so that's just one thought process someone could have. But again, typically in social thought, people have moved from a functional understanding to then seeing what, what's wrong with this, uh, how could this be improved, what impact is this having outside of just this one thing. Um, so conflict theory says, you know, we need to see the, fam the relationship of the family and the institution of the family as impacted by and impacting everything else a person is involved in. Um, so this, when they say here that the family is related to the state, there are many reasons for, for this connection. Um, so remember, going back, as I said, I'll keep saying this, um, but in the, in the Industrial Revolution, the division of labor in the household with men going to work and women staying at home, that was a state-ordained activity and behavior and law. Um, remember, I told you about vagrancy laws that were instituted against men who were trying to flee uh, working in these new factories and urban centers. Um, this law prevented them uh, from being single, basically. Um, there are also many laws, as you know, laws around divorce, around separation. Um, these would uh, prohibit people in certain times and places around the world from, you know, leaving relationships at certain times. Um, laws around age of consent in marriage uh, kind of govern who can get married. Things like same-sex marriage not being legal until recently, again, means those individuals could not be, uh, form kind of textbook families. Um, so conflict theory, again, says anytime you're looking at the family, rather than just seeing this one kind of integrating function, think about all the other norms going on in society, all the rules, all the laws that may have impacted um, your specific definition of the family in, in your country. Um, so basically, going back to the gender example, conflict theorists would say, is it really just functional? Um, that is it just a coincidence or just happenstance that men are the ones that get to earn incomes and have the power in the relationship, have the economic power? Um, you know, as I said, everything you do in real life, if you just think of it practically, um, under that division of labor, men are going out and working and building careers and getting work experience and making relationships outside of the family. Um, whereas under that scheme, women are very dependent on the husbands. Um, you know, you hear many stories of women that were married for 30 years and then they never had a, a, a real, you know, a, a meaningful career. Um, and then they, they're divorced and they're dependent on alimony and it's very hard for them to raise their children as a single mother. Um, so conflict theorists, we'll see that leads to feminist theories critique of, of, of uh, marriage and the family. Um, but a conflict theorist might say, hey, well, we talk about how society is patriarchal. One way that patriarchy kind of influences us is by the way the family's set up. Um, so again, this even, even you know, um, male thinkers and philosophers realized this aspect, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago. Friedrich, uh, Friedrich Engels was Marx's kind of co-writer um, on most of his major documents. Um, his most famous piece that he wrote by himself was called The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State. And without getting on into all the details, essentially his argument was the family really is um, the way in which, or, or, or the norms of the family and the arrangements of the family is the way that the state or the nation, he was talking about countries that were becoming uh, capitalist, um, this was a way for the nation to kind of control um, its economic production. Um, and key in this was that women and children were dependent on male breadwinners. Um, so the whole working situation of, you know, the way wages were paid, I talked about this early in the term, this concept of the family wage or the living wage, so much of our economic life was based on the idea that you know, all men have to work um, and all women and children are dependent on those men. Um, so again, that's why those vagrancy laws were instituted. It just was not a reality for a man to say, no, I'm not working or I'll just live poor or whatever. Um, they, they had to go out and support the family and then in turn support the nation. Again, as I said, the family is kind of a, a, a mini nation. 
Um, so without bring, bringing too many connections and blowing your minds, um, when we talked about Disney and the importance of, of how, you know, the princes were framed as um, hardworking and resilient and tough, um, but princesses, princesses kind of as these damsels in, in distress needing to be protected, taken care of, this really goes all the way down to our basic definitions of what men and women and children do um, in the family. Um, you know, that's why when you look online and you see kind of stereotypes about women, um, there's often associations with um, being infantilized too. Uh, so women are often seen as more childlike. Um, so again, the relation, uh, again, of women, is women and children being t taken care of by these resilient, tough guys, ready to work, um, self-sacrificing, all of that. Um, it feeds a lot of different aspects of life. Um, okay. So, as usual, again, you see, I always, I like it, and I was happy. I'm talking a lot about theory, because I, I told you, I was surprisingly, I was very happy when I looked. Oh, ugh, that's a straw. I thought it was a pencil. Um, ugh. So, anyway, um, I, uh, when I looked through your tests, I saw that the vast majority of you were happy that we, uh, every week we bring in theory, and we look at them as perspectives. Um, so, what I'm going to try to do again is increasingly show you kind of my own thought process or what I imagine someone else's thought process to be as I present these, just to show you again how I'm not trying to just force you to re-remember these theories, but to think of, again, how people can, can vary uh, in terms of their opinions about things, um, even the same person as they kind of go through a thought sequence. Um, and that's why it's so important that you engage in the class and do the readings multiple times um, and see, you know, Ah, am I viewing this topic as a functionalist, as a conflict theorist? Um, it doesn't matter the theory, but just, you know, that you're thinking about it differently, using different assumptions. Um, so, again, someone might start with a functionalist perspective. The family has functions, it's integrating people, it's small society. Conflict theorists then, oh, but there's problematic assumptions there, it's reinforcing gender norms, and it's creating those gender norms. Um, and then a symbolic interactionist says, okay, well, those are all things that might be happening. We're deep in the realm of theory. How do I know any of this stuff? How do I know if the family is really linked to patriarchy in the way you're saying it? How do I know if it's linked to, you know, expressive roles in the way you're saying it? Maybe it is, but what I need to do is I need to go out and study people at a micro level, so like a personal level, and I want to see how people actually understand their kind of embodiment and relations within families. Um, so here again, this is the, the sociology started much more macro. Remember, we were in dialogue with psychologists and stuff who were studying people's real, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, studies of experiments and things. And as sociologists, we were all like, no, we need to look at the big institutions and the cultures. So micro sociology, symbolic interactionism attempts to bridge those things and say, let's just go out and study people. Um, so here, the key concept in symbolic interactionism that emerged from these sorts of studies, again, mostly qualitative methods, but also quantitative too. It shifted the way we asked people things. You know, you ask them more things about how they feel with their parents, um, who they think is uh, responsible for their welfare and all that. Um, so uh, we combined those studies, and one of the enduring findings of this was really this concept of role, and then later role strain. Um, so Irving Goffman, huge sociologist, um, he wrote that uh, everyone is kind of, and, and I know Goffman came up in contemporary theory too, um, he really said, okay, all these norms and values and beliefs, all these cultural things that people have, um, these all basically put us on a stage. So in our life, um, we have all of these roles, almost like actors, um, that are things we fulfill. So, for example, um, th and this, this sounds abstract, but think of it. Okay, you are a little kid in elementary school, and it's, um, it's bring your parents to school day or whatever. I don't know what you call that, but show and, show and tell mommy or something. And you're supposed to, I don't know if people do that, but I'm out of touch. But, but let's say you're in elementary school, and, or let's say they're just picking you up from school or something. 
Now you're little Johnny, you're in grade one, and you just got first place on the math test or something. And then you, you know, they're like, uh, you're waiting outside of school, waiting for your parents, and, and it looks like you're waiting for your parents to pick you up. Um, but then it's your sister or your older brother. And then someone asks you, oh, why, why, who's that person? Why isn't your mom or dad picking you up? And then you say, oh, well, you know, actually, um, I'm, I'm an orphan. Or actually, I don't, um, I don't have parents. You can't play the role of kind of a normal, quote unquote, kid in your mind. You see other people with parents picking them up, maybe talking about them, then bringing them lunch, but you don't have that. Um, there are many things like that. So the, the same idea as an LGBTQ person not being able to, to get married, you know, not so long ago, they experienced role strain because they're raised thinking a role that you want to fill in this, you know, Shakespearean, all the world's a stage sort of thing. Um, you, you think, you know, you get married, you have a job. These are all roles that you have. Um, you know, you, you look a certain way, you know, you look like a Disney princess or prince, prince, prince or princess or whatever. You do these things. These are all roles. Um, so the, the shift in symbolic interactionism, again, it's not reinventing the wheel or anything, but it's saying all of these norms and values and, and institutional things we talk about as sociologists, we need to see how people interpret them as roles that they kind of take on and phase in and out of. Um, and role strain is this idea of you being, you know, emotionally happy when you're fulfilling a role. So, you know, when you talk to older individuals in particular, reflecting on their marriages, they may say, you know, and their lives, you know, I lived a great life. I had a meaningful job as a teacher, as an accountant, whatever. So that's a role. Um, I had a loving marriage and family and grandchildren. That's another role. Um, or they'll say, you know, I was in a loveless marriage. That's a role that was, you know, they had a strain that they were hiding. Um, but anyway, all of this, needless to say, we start with looking at functional integration, then we problematize it, and then we look at the strain or fit that people experience in these roles through surveys, through interviews, through observation. Again, I've done that in terms of careers and work-life balance when for my dissertation, I, I did life history interviews with people and asked them, you know, how do you feel about your work? Is this what you expected? Um, and, and they'll go on and kind of talk about all the role conflicts and strains they experienced. Okay, so we're almost through this. Um, so sociological approaches, again, the feminist theory really, or view of the family, um, was greatly inspired by Friedrich Engels and the origins of the family and private property. Um, essentially here, uh, they, they see, they take it one step further and say, yes, of course, you have to see the family as both generating and serving as a kind of continual source of women's subordination. So again, it's not a coincidence for feminist theorists that parents buy their kids um, different gendered toys. Um, it's not a coincidence that in the school system, male te uh, teachers may kind of give male students the benefit of the doubt and call on them more and have different expectations. Um, so for feminist theory, they are really against this notion of, uh, you know, men having more, more of kind of a natural right to, to having economic independence and to being sole breadwinners um, and, and having that sort of instrumental responsibility while women are relegated the expressive responsibility. Um, so this will be a big theme kind of later in this lecture after, our, um, after we finish our theories. Um, and then lastly, of the theoretical perspectives, um, the most recent, again, growing out, so, so function, then conflict, then looking at it, and then realizing, okay, conflict is kind of the key here. We've measured it as, you know, with surveys and interviews. We've seen um, that, that gender inequality is really uh, one of the major issues with the family. Um, so post-structural theory says, okay, we have these ideas of families, we now need to, you know, really question these assumptions. Um, and, and queer theory is on this same page, too. I mean, queer theory is all about disrupting norms, queering norms. Remember, queer means strange or other than. Um, queer became, was, was an insult used against, um, you know, gay and homosexual individuals and then was reappropriated um, by, by the gay community as, as saying, yeah, we're queer, we're different from, from normal, and that's fine. 
uh, different is fine. Um, so queer theory and post-structural theory, again, try to say, okay, our notions of what a good father is, again, someone who provides financially, is tough, um, you know, is the bad cop with the parents, and the good mother, um, you know, being there for the kids, doing the domestic work, all of that, both of these, and, and that they're, it's a heterosexual couple, both of these theories together, kind of inspired by the conflict and feminist traditions, say, we need to see this family as really reinforcing a lot of unfair power balances. Um, okay, so, and I will show you pictures of different people as we do this, so I'm not, um, and different animals and whatever. Okay, so, so now bringing it to today. Because again, in sociology, you know, you may think, oh, everything's in these complex webs of power relations, everything's awful, and what do we do? Things are, you know, there's, people are changing, even if they're people on Netflix, whatever, there, there's new things coming out. New family forms are being acknowledged. Um, so for study buddy activity number two, there are numerous examples of family forms in popular media. Consider your favorite television shows and discuss the types of families they portray with your study buddy for five minutes. What do you each think about these portrayals? So I'm pushing your active learning one more. I want you to each tell each other examples. Um, and look at that, that's, that's not happy. What kind of stock photo is that? She's like, she's questioning things. Anyway, that's why I zoomed in on her there. That's a weird photo. Anyway, so what do you each think about the portrayals and discuss? So TV shows, you get to talk about TV, you get to talk about binge watching, and then what portrayals, and what do you think about these portrayals? How do they fit these definitions? How do they challenge them, okay? the energy levels of the class as well um, with, with this. Um, so does anyone want to share kind of the TV shows or popular media objects they came up with um, and what they and their partner um, thought about these portrayals? Again, just this, this is all for me. This is to keep me relevant and in the pulse of student life. Yep, okay, so I'll mic you up. Put you on the stage. I can't talk about actors and roles and then not put you there. Okay, so we were talking about um, Ugly Betty. It's kind mm. of um, like a really old show, but um, instead of a um, single mom, it's a single dad who's very like you know uh, motherly in a way. So it's mm -hmm. the um, um, expressive role, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, he is, in, uh, I think he's an immigrant from Mexico, right? And then uh, he has a grandson who is a um, I think he's um, gay or bi, and then with them um, two daughters who are adults, um, one of them working and things like that. So I think it's very going against that kind of stereotype of like, you know, mm -hmm. single mom, you know, struggling sometimes and such, you know, things like that basically. Yeah, so the show um, Ugly Betty, um, it, it's talking about how it, it kind of flies in the face of a lot of stereotypes about lone parent dumb um, and, and, and single mother, uh, sing, the single mother experience and single father experience as well. Um, and also of immigrant families and kind of showing this, how this uh, family form uh, is really much more pliable and, and different and, and more diffuse uh, than has often been portrayed. So we have Ugly Betty. Anything else? I'll get to you after, just already in the front. All right. Like, we talked about the shows like uh, The Simpson, Family Guy, and uh, American Dad, right? And it seems like mm. every show, like, the guy is just shown as, you know, like, the bumbling idiot, you know, like, the comedic relief type person of the show who just goes to work, comes home, and that's it. But then his wife is doing all the housework, and she's, like, the greatest thing that ever happened to him, like, that changed his life. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that? Well, it's pretty, st I don't know, stereotypical. Like, I, I think it's just the irony of it, like, like like most most you know fathers I assume are not you know crazy like them they actually like work hard and you know strive to provide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Simpsons, Family Guy, American Dad, kind of a, a commonality is the fathers kind of bumbling around, um, and the wife is really much smarter, much more active with the family, doing all. She's kind of like the idea of the super mom. Um, but still the commonality that she's, she's not working. Um, so those shows are interesting in that they reinforce uh, kind of the, the stereotype of the lone provider male, um, but at the same time kind of consciously make fun uh, of, of the male role as well. 
Um, so that, so they're, they're reinforcing, but at the same time, problematizing some of these relations. You, perfect. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> Um, so we were talking about the fosters, and um, if you have a mosh, it's kind of complicated to explain. There's a lot going on, but it's about a lesbian couple, and they have foster kids and adopted kids, and one child is a biological child from a past marriage, and um, it's just about going through all the like the foster care and adoption and what it means. Of like, um, they go through a lot of like, oh, like you know, just because they're adopted, like they're my, they're still my. They're still my sister, and they're no different than my biological um, siblings or anything like that. And I just think that's really interesting. It also goes through um, each of the kids, and all the actors are all different ethnicities and races too. So it just has like a whole, just a whole different background on it. Mm -hmm. Now, so the, so the Fosters just providing thanks, just providing um, again a kind of different perspective, more reflecting kind of contemporary reality, a little bit better than these old definitions of the family. Again, as the student said that I was kind of joshing around with before. Um, really, I think a lot of more recent shows do focus on the families um, or the definition of the family really being more around trust, as one student said, and love, as another student said, um, and less on this kind of, you know, male-female parent-child split. So good. Okay. Um, so we're done most of the brunt work now. Um, so we've covered again definitions of the family, theoretical explanations of the family. You've done one little policy draft to apply. So again, the role of the, the, the definition of the family is important because it impacts a, our kind of material bottom line, so thinking of things like medical coverage, if you, if you aren't, on the one hand, if you aren't defined as a family, it can hurt you materially. Um, but then we saw when we opened it up that, you know, the family now is this big evolving concept and it's really much more up to the individual who they see uh, as part of their family and not. Um, so legally and societally it's important uh, because it can hurt people financially and make them feel like outcasts if they're not part of a family. Um, but again, uh, there, there has been a shift away from kind of dogmatic definitions of the family too. Um, so now going back again to the significance of the family, again more, more uh, pragmatically, um, if family, we, when looking at any family, so this is to extend kind of um, you know, any kind of course on the family is really focused on its connections uh, with, with women's experience um, as, as again, the historically, the nuclear kind of heterosexual family has greatly disenfranchised women, um, relative men. Um, so in the family, and again, thinking of expressive and instrumental roles, another way of thinking about that is any family, in order for it to exist, um, depends on two forms of labor. Um, so one is paid work, and the other is unpaid work. Um, the paid work is the sort of careers that the members of the family have. And, and you know, I kind of like this definition because I think it encompasses almost any, um, any family that shares residence. Um, so even if you're living with your friends, uh, this, this would still work. Um, so income generating work, whether it's roommates, whether it's a heterosexual or gay couple or a thruple or anything, um, they need some sort of money. So they, maybe it's inherited instead of income generating work, but typically um, they, they will need some sort of money to fund their organism, their family. Um, and then they'll need unpaid domestic labor. Um, so who does the cleaning? Uh, who organizes the rooms? Who does the interior decorating? Who throws out the garbage? Uh, even if you're extremely wealthy, that unpaid domestic labor still needs to be done by someone. Um, unless you're so wealthy that you just move from like hotel to hotel constantly or something with your family. Um, but then even still, the, the hotel staff has to clean. So unless, I guess the only way you could avoid the unpaid domestic labor is if you like burned wherever you lived, uh, set, set house fires. Um, but then the firefighters should have to clean the ashes. But that's not domestic because they're getting paid. So anyway, so you could find a way around this definition if you really wanted to, but most people wouldn't. 
Now, justing aside again, this is an important topic. Um, so the idea of the family and seeing it as relying on paid and unpaid work, again, is central to what you could call the, the feminist project. Um, of again, not in, just meaning you know giving equal rights uh, to women um, over time, seeing women's place in society as problematic. Um, so uh, Marilyn Waring has this clever title: um, "If Women Counted," um, and clever in the way that you could think of it in two ways. Uh, so one, if women counted all the things they did, all the time they spent. And number two, if women counted, as in if women mattered, relative men. Um, so Waring uh, discusses, she says, domestic labor traditionally isn't just unpaid, but it's unrecognized. Um, so, you know, people don't always keep tallies of the amount of time they spend uh, doing the laundry, e even if they're single, um, single or couples or big families. People don't tend to take stock of the work that they've done. Um, they often see it as, quote unquote, dirty work or drudge work or uh, labor of love. So things they're just doing for their loved ones. Um, people don't account for domestic work in the same way they do for paid work, um, mainly because you're not being paid. Uh, and the whole ideology behind the, the kind of private family was that women's, th their whole role, women's role was expressive. And in, from the bottom of their hearts, they just wanted to do this stuff. Um, so again, feminist thinkers like Dorothy Smith that we read said, no, like, sure, many mothers and women may really like taking care of their kids and even their husbands, um, but the ideologies we have around that, that, that naturalize this and kind of make it seem like that's what women have to do, that's problematic because it's kind of under-recognizing the, the tasks and accomplishments of this gender. Um, so Statistic Canada says, if we were to value domestic labor at the rate that they're paid in the market, sorry. if they were to value domestic labor at market rate, um, so I took a class in undergrad at St. George called Women and Work, and we did this there too, and it was a similar number. Um, so all the things they do, so being a seamstress, so sewing things, being a therapist for the, for the husband and children, um, uh, you know, painting around the house, all of these things. If you add them all up by hour and hourly wage, the unpaid domestic labor um, would be $297 billion a year. So not just housewives doing this, but any, everyone in the world. If all the domestic labor, or sorry, in, in, in the country, in Canada, if everyone's domestic labor, adult, kid, wife, husband, whatever, was added up, that's the money. So this is a huge industry of work that we said isn't work, basically. Um, so the, this has been inspiring kind of sociologist view of the family, of saying we can't just keep seeing as an individual issue the fact that many women find themselves in this situation of doing all these hours of work that really, you know, if, if you did them in the public sphere would be paid and would be recognized, maybe underpaid, you know, cleaning and all these jobs aren't societally valued very much. Um, but if we, you know, if we don't recognize that they're doing real work, um, then the kind of status quo idea of the stay-at-home mom can keep being reinforced. And again, seeing the increasing spikes in divorce rates um, and, and diminishment of the family, this puts women in a rougher position relative men, that they're doing all this work, predominantly, and not getting recognized for it, and then having less kind of tangible skills on the labor market should they need to work afterwards. Um, so Arlie Hochschild was key in kind of formalizing this, this split between uh, paid and unpaid work, um, and seeing both kinds as real work, um, although only one is really being recognized. And she created a really interesting concept to cover this, um, which is very intuitive, but also very useful. Um, so she said, you know, women have this kind of special life. Um, they work what she called a second shift. Um, so women that were employed, so she's writing a bit later in time than some of the previous feminist thinkers, even women who work, they still, and this is where the unpaid stuff becomes so important to think through, 
there's still the expectation that even if the, the woman is the primary breadwinner, it's, let's say you have a lawyer uh, married to a teacher or something, and the woman's the lawyer and the man's the teacher or you know lesbian couple and whatever, one of them is the, the lawyer and the other's the teacher, the expectation is still that the mother will do a lot of the housework, if not most of it. Um, and, and there were studies that, that proved that, empirical studies, big quantitative studies, that showed that actually women who made quite a bit more than their husbands, um, the more they made relative to their husband, the more they actually did housework. So, and, and they said in, when they were interviewed, they were compensating kind of for the fact that they were making their man feel not like a proper breadwinner. Um, so these norms and things, you know, you can think of yourself in this sort of situation in the future, um, potentially. This, this, these norms, again, impact women on a personal level, um, but then societally, right? When you see, you know, caring professions are dominated by women, ones that seem more mathematical are dominated by men. These all tie into really these expressive and instrumental ideas um, and, and how those are gendered. Um, so again, in sociology, you can always see how everything's connected and super important. Um, okay, so lastly, predicting. I know this process has aged you. Oh, you know, you're, uh, you're, I saw the, the uh, progression of, um, of interest wane over the thing, over the time. Um, but, you know, it's happy. Uh, so the last question I will have you do um, and leave happy and thinking good things. Um, you and your, not related to the topic, but more related to the photo. Um, you and your study buddy have just been hired by the government of Canada to develop a domestic labor payment policy. So we just talked about domestic labor again, all the stuff you do around the home that's not paid. Some people hire things like personal support workers, nannies, and so on. Spend five minutes with your study buddy to think through and address the following questions. If you were making, again, if you were, if the government, you're making a domestic labor payment policy, so you're going to pay those housewives, you're going to pay those whatever people, what sort of tasks would be included in the policy? So what's real housework or domestic work? How much money would each task be worth? How would the policy be regulated? And overall, because we can do all these things, do you think, and you may argue about this, do you think that this policy is a good idea? Or, if you, so if you think it's not a good idea, what else should be done? Or should anything be done? These are all things people think about. Um, so go with your study buddy. We're escalating our policy making in social AO3. Cool. So we'll, we'll be able to end in roughly 10 minutes. Um, does anyone want to share some of the tasks or issues or anything that came to your mind from answering this with their study buddies? Oh, yeah. Oh, I just had a question. Oh. Yeah, so it's about this. But, like, wouldn't if you, um, if you started paying for, like, domestic work, wouldn't that just, like, push capitalist agenda? So, like, how would that necessarily, like, destroy, like, the, the stereotypical norms? Or wouldn't it just, like, tie more into capitalism? So it's not even, like, even though mm -hmm, they're being mm -hmm. paid, it, it'll still be, like, okay, who's getting paid more? So, like, this doesn't necessarily solve anything. So that's something that came up. So, great question. Even if these tasks were paid, would it not just be kind of pushing the problem like to the side, like the deeper problem of the fact that people are still fighting for differently paid tasks and we're still valuing different things differently? So even these tasks, let's say you were to pay them and you were to say, okay, you spend an hour a day as a dishwasher or whatever, those are still going to be paid a lot less than something else you could have been doing. Um, so that's a very fair point. This, this, uh, in, in my class as well, years ago when we talked about this, um, I think the goal of this was more just kind of step one of recognizing, okay, this work is happening, and it's happening predominantly uh, by women and mothers, and then step two would more be, okay, so now let's think through the ramifications of this again. Um, so I agree. I think that's probably, probably why this policy doesn't exist, of people saying, you know, um, where's, where would it come from? What would this look like? We're still valuing things differently. Yep. idea but it probably won't be possible because there's no way of knowing how much the people actually work like you do want to like install cameras which is a whole other problem and people are just gonna kind of be able to lie about it and it just doesn't work mm -hmm, right so the idea of, of oversight um, so you know in paid employment you're either paid based on 
you know, the output that you do. So let's say, um, let's say I was paid for like how much I publish or how much I teach. Um, you know how much I'm doing those things. Even if, no, even if my boss isn't here in the classroom, um, presumably students would, uh, the, the chair of the department would get emails from students saying, hey, Lawrence never shows up to his class or, you know, when he, when he shows up, he's like falling asleep or whatever. Um, so people have oversight on their jobs. Um, whereas, you know, if I was getting, if I was getting paid for the amount of time I read stories to my kids or did physical labor around the house, unless you had surveillance cams, um, there wouldn't be motivation for family members to report one another. Um, so they could, they'd all kind of be in, in conjunction with one another. Um, so yeah, so I think what, what this thought experiment is designed for you to do um, is more to think, okay, if I itemize all the work that stay-at-home moms, stay-at-home dads, and just parents, and, and you all do, um, what would that be worth in the market? And then think, oh, it's kind of interesting that a lot of people are doing all of this work and not being recognized for it. That's more the main point. Um, you know, ideals are one thing, putting them in practice are another having this regulated would kind of administratively be a nightmare. Um, but at the same time, it is, you know, it puts people in a bit of a pickle uh, because this work needs to be done. It predominantly falls in the hands of women, but for all these difficult reasons, um, it, it set, tends not to be accounted for. Um, so before family ends, so again, focusing on women, again, the family uh, has tr traditionally um, exacerbated, you know, as families change, people's rights and things have been going up, but traditionally and historically, uh, it, it has marginalized women more than men um, and children more than parents. Um, but so again, the, f uh, the family is often constructed as, quote, a haven in a heartless world. So when I said early in the Industrial Revolution, think of those men that really did not want to work in those factories. Again, many of them to the point where they were getting arrested um, by, under the vagrancy laws. It was brutal work. They didn't want to do it. Um, the, the wife and children were supposed to be nurturing at home. So again, a lot of the norms we have around wives and kids being more emotional, more ir irrational, more whatever than men, a lot of that comes from that time period. Now, the idea of a family as this kind of cozy, emotional hearth, meaning like, you know, the center of a home, um, this is disrupted um, by the lived realities of many individuals in families. Um, so we haven't talked about it yet, and unfortunately it's at the end of the lecture, but it is a major issue, um, domestic assault, assault um, and violence against women in families. Um, so women are more than, likely, uh, more than twice as likely um, to be assaulted by someone they know than by a stranger. Um, and most often, this is, uh, talking about heterosexual women, this is most often boyfriends, husbands, long-term male partners. Um, just as how children are more likely to be assaulted by their parents than parents by children. Um, so people that are, you know, traditionally seen as more powerful are more likely to assault. Um, ch even though children are abused by their parents um, more often than society would hope, um, it pales in, in, uh, it pales in uh, light of how many women are assaulted. Um, so I, I would say the primary kind of unit of assault is the heterosexual union. Um, and think of those norms again of, you know, men are supposed to go outside, earn a lot of money, Maybe a man is frustrated, he's not making a lot of money. Maybe his wife, who he thinks is supposed to be nurturing him, is, is, talk, is complaining about something financial or has real concerns about how things are going. Um, but he's thinking, you know, no, you're my wife. You're supposed to act this way. You're supposed to defer to me. Um, and that is part of what accounts for women being 85% of victims. Um, again, not blaming the victim at all, saying the opposite, um, that the, this is a structure conducive to violence against women. So that's part of why feminists um, are trying and historically have tried to change the definition of the family and say, sure, some women may want to be nurturing, may not want to work, may want to be part of this traditional definition, but this is putting women in a very kind of potentially scary situation. By making women financially dependent on men due to not working, due to not, um, you know, due to doing all this uh, unpaid domestic labor, you're setting them up in this situation of dependence where they can be violated uh, in many ways. 
Um, for context, marital rape wasn't even a thing, um, as I said earlier in, in last term, I think. So the idea of a wife being raped by a husband, um, that wasn't even a legal reality until the mid-20th century. Um, just as how women could not divorce their husbands, um, it had to be a mutual thing. Um, and that still is the case um, in some places around the world. Um, so um, this is most common from ages 25 to 34. Um, again, situating it sociologically within the life course of individuals, ages 25 to 34 is roughly when people are getting married most. And this is when expectations can kind of go unmet. Um, and again, thinking of violent wife abusers, um, they may have bitten off more than they can chew. Um, they may have kind of duped their partner into what the marriage was about, all of these kind of things um, that, that cause um, uh, horrible violence against women. Um, and again, so just like homicide victims, for those of you that watch CSI and Forensic Files and all these things, I know you must all do that if you want to go in criminology and stuff. Those shows are, I, I love the Forensic Files. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, really interesting. Um, but like nine out of 10 times you see the victims a woman, very often uh, her boyfriend or husband. Um, so these are, as much as I jest about certain things, it's a very serious issue. Um, and so it's not you know, just about money, it's also about people's lives. Um, not that money isn't important for your life, too. Um, so intimate femicide is a term. Femicide, again, the killing of women. Um, and again, social scientists have been trying to lower the, the odds of women being killed um, in general in the population. Um, and so this is, again, taking real or, or taking seriously um, the fact that most of the women that are murdered are murdered by people that they know. Um, so intimate femicide accounted for the majority of women killed um, between 1974 and 1994. Um, so again, roughly two thirds to uh, two thirds to three quarters of women that were murdered were murdered by family members, or you know, using the broader definition of family, close friends, not just acquaintances. Um, speaking to that, 75%, so let's say three quarters of women that were killed were killed by someone they know, 75% of the time it took place in their home. Um, so they could have invited a date over or a friend over, but more often than not, it's someone they live with. Um, so again, and, and this is happening predominantly to women. Um, and this, I, this, the idea that women, again, bear the brunt of death on this case, so the gravest of things, um, reflects wider norms. Again, about women being uh, more subservient and deferring to men. Um, and then you can imagine in these crimes of passion or even more premeditated moments, um, women are often killed for violating the expected norms of the household. And that's really what brings all of this and makes it so key. Um, women, uh, when you watch those shows, it's often, oh, um, she's, presuming, she's presumably having, a, having an affair, or more likely, she may leave the house. Um, she may not like the way he's treating the children. Um, she may not like the way he's drinking. Uh, overall, it, it often comes down in many of these cases to her not fulfilling her presumed role as the right mother. And then in the man's, you know, shattered mentality then at that point, thinking, well, I'll kill her. Uh, oftentimes, there are mur um, murder-suicides as well, uh, where the whole family uh, is, is killed by the man, including himself. Um, so these sort of awful kind of maximal situations um, attest even further to the need as kind of society, members of society to think, you know, what pressure and what situations and what roles and what potential strains and dangers um, do our institutions put people in? Uh, and remember, we talked last week about Merton and those um, latent functions. So even if you take the functionalist perspective to the family and see it as integrating uh, people, if you also see that women's kind of most likely way of being murdered is by family members, um, then it makes you question, um, you know, to what extent is this function of integration really working? Um, again, this, it's a more stark case, but these are, these are just things to have you think through the multidimensionality of these issues. 
Um, so just things to consider going forward. You know, I presented a few reasons, but think why are sociologists generally interested in studying families? Um, so, you know, the intimate connection of gender and norms. I think the family is a microcosm of society, for better or for worse. Um, the way that people raise their kids, the way that partners talk to one another, are based on the wider norms we have. Um, how have families in Canada changed over time? So again, they really were a product of the Industrial Revolution, the separation of spheres, seeing men do instrumental things and women expressive. This has changed over time, but when you watch a lot of movies and TV, you see that that's always kind of the reference point. Um, it'll be interesting when the reference point changes, uh, but it's still kind of the go-to thing that you have to, you know, if you're, if you're showing a, a movie about a family that's gay or defined on friendship, usually that's explained early on, because it's assumed that, oh, that's different than, you know, what the audience thought. Um, and then, interestingly, you know, what theoretical perspective would you use to explain intimate femicide? Um, so do you think it's a latent function of the family? Do you think it's patriarchal? Do you think um, in symbolic interaction it's about role strain? All of these things are just to think, you know, using your own experiences and things you see in the media, how would you explain these sorts of things? Um, so lastly, just before you go, so for the test, um, we are in, we're going to set up a test review session um, for test uh, one uh, before test two so that you can look over your multiple choice uh, answers um, and short answers and things. Um, I'm purposely putting that kind of closer to test one. So one, so sorry, to test two, um, because it's, I think it's better for you to have that fresh in your head, kind of see where you went wrong and improve your study strategies a bit closer to the date. Um, but I'll try to have more than one date with myself and some of the TAs um, so that all of you, all of, all of you that are interested um, can have a chance to kind of see your test and, and talk with us um, about some of the answers if you'd like. Um, so that said, you've now done essay one, test one, and essay two. Um, so all you have left, aside from all your bi-weekly tutorials and engaging Revel stuff, all you have is essay three, which I think I said last week I do have ethical approval over. So that'll be fun when we get, we get cooking and I want to see what you, who you interview and all of that. Um, so we, you just have essay three and then test two and test three. So you're half done the course. It's amazing. So um, I, I just, um, how do I do this? I guess, wait, I think I can do it from here. So stick around for uno moment, for just one second, one moment. Okay, wait. Okay, perfect. Okay. Because I want to know what to do for next week. So poll. Choose a slide type. I guess multiple choice. What kind of quiz do you want? Do you want, oh. Damn it. I'm actually not frustrated. I'm just being whatever I am. I, this is how I am when I do things on my own. So if you get frustrated with things, that's fine, because I do too. Do you want open-ended or multiple choice? Yeah, that's too much work. Multiple choice, OK. Oh, you can already type in the code without a question. Um, OK, so question number one, do you like the, oh, the study buddy questions. Yes. No. Yes. But ask less questions. <laughs> I know how you think. Don't, don't, don't. No. Not engaging enough, but salvageable. Okay? No, three people saying no right off the bat. Because remember, this class is evolving like definitions of the family. So I will take, I take your feedback seriously. Do, 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 do. Do 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 do. I 
I hope this teaches you things too, because you know this is the instructor's dilemma. I see. Well, that's like 24, 30, 32. That's like 20% of people don't like them, but then everyone else likes them to an extent. So you can't please everybody. But that's something you know as you get older or whatever in life you realize that. So what I'm going to try to do, I'm going to do it next time, and I'm going to ask. A spectrum. So I'm going to ask questions that are a little bit lighter, but similar quantity. So a little bit less, and still do them. All right. Anyway, so we'll see. I'll vary them a bit every week. Hopefully, we'll hit our sweet spot where 100% of people say, "I'll put a new option," and it'll be, "I wish study buddy questions were asked to me all the time, everywhere in my life." Anyway, so have a great week, um, and. No tutorials this week, of course, because you had tutorials last week.、Uh, I look forward to seeing you next Monday.